ton of questions as well. I, can, I don't really know how to get the chat and the questions at the same time, so I'll just kind of fly through this. It's a short presentation of just kind of globally what we do and what are the strategies that we teach um, that we found are the best for, for, for a lot of producers. And so, um, so just so you know, I've got, um, I'll be monitoring the chat, so if there's any, any questions that come up, I'll just um, yell stop or I'll yell a question out and uh, say that there's one and then we can just address it as we uh, as we go along. Okay, yeah, absolutely. And then afterwards as well, I can take, uh, we can take, you know, 15, 20, 30 minutes to, to answer questions, whatever. Sweet. So let's, uh, let's go ahead. Um, so the theme of the, the theme is the scaling your kombucha production. That's what a lot of people call me up for. Um, and so, so let's jump in. So this is me uh, wearing a, a, a shirt with the top button button. Um, today I chose to not do that. Um, I'm a fermentation expert. Um, I, I feel safe calling myself a fermentation expert because I've done things enough times to know what the top 10 mistakes are uh, in a lot of different fermentations. So I can go, I go, yes, do that, don't do these 10 things. And so I feel like that's what an expert is, right? Um, I uh, was one of the co-founders of Rise Kombucha, so um, so I've left that I've left that that business uh, to avoid conflict of interest. I'm not I'm not working with them anymore. That way, I can you can ensure even if you're a competitor to Rise Kombucha, you can be sure that I have no uh, you know no no conflict of interest. Um, and I really help producers go from one bucket to a million to a million bottles uh, and anything in between. You know, one of the biggest things that people come up to come up to me with is they go Seb uh, you know am I you know a legitimate kombucha producer so my job is really to help people uh, just be there for people who are kind of like not surrounded by different kombucha producers and go yes what you're doing is perfect what you're doing is fine you know whether you're really big or really small like no one's an imposter and kind of just helping helping people kind of deal with that but also kind of go yes what you're doing is correct and what it's what everyone else is doing or here are the walls that you're going to hit um, you know, when you reach these, these bigger, these bigger productions and how to deal with them. So, um, so we do, uh, education, we do consulting, um, and we, uh, you know, we, we actually gave this a class. I started giving a class in white labs in California about uh, five years ago. And then, uh, the, the class migrated towards Montreal in our factory. Um, and after about 20 times giving that class and like fixing it up every time and making it better and better, uh, I realized that. I wasn't changing it anymore because all the questions were kind of answered. And so we recorded it, we recorded it, realizing that people, people, uh, you know, three months after coming to the class, they don't remember everything I said. And so by putting it online, people can have access to exactly what I said whenever they want. So, um, it also ends up being, I don't know, it's just like, a, it's just fun for everyone. So, um, kombucha masterclass.com about 15 hours of video in total. It's exactly like having me or Tom, uh, my head brewer in your factory with you, taking the time to explain things slowly. Um, so you can check it out. But there's actually a, a Canada, 33% uh, off if you use this promo code. So I put up a, um, a link to it in the chat so everyone can um, click on it and take a look there. And would you say that the master class is for like someone who's just starting out home brewing or someone who's kind of thinking about commercial brewing? Like who, who is it, who is it for? Cause I know that we've got kind of a cross section of, kombucha heads here well i mean so so who is it who is it not for it's not for someone who wants to learn to just make kombucha at home mm -hmm. there's a lot of information and a lot of the equipment is just slightly bigger right so like you know we start off at like corny kegs cornelius kegs or even just like bottle fermenting you know 20 liter buckets if you want to be brewing four liters at a time then you can go for fermentation revolution the book and it'll just kind of show you the ropes a little bit um, we also have a book called the, uh, well, we don't actually have a title for it yet, but it's really more centered on kombucha that'll be coming out in September. Um, but basically, uh, if you are looking to scale up and, uh, yeah, if you're looking to scale up and you want to sell in, you want to sell either at, um, you know, a farmer's market, or you've been selling at a farmer's market for a little while and you just want to kind of know what the ropes are, what the game is, you know, if I try this, what's going to happen? If I try this, what's going to happen? What's safe? What's not safe? How to grow? safely and with control over your business, then, um, then, then it's the way to go, I'd say. Um, There's one quick question here. I'm not sure if it's relevant there, but uh, it says, would it help with HACCP plans? Um, we do, uh, so we do deal with, uh, we do have a HACCP, um, 
So that's a, it's a big question, right? HACCP plans. HACCP plans, the actual plan itself is built with all of the things that we teach in the class. So basically, um, so the answer is yes. So if you want to go, well, in a HACCP plan, you need to tell people how you, how you clean your tanks. And so we, in the class, we show exactly how to clean your tanks. Uh, in a HACCP plan, it show, it, you need to show how your product is uh, safe from microbiological contamination. We talk about that in the class. We talk about how to, how to make sure that your pH is always good, how to make sure that your pH meter is calibrated. So, um, so yes, it's, it will help you with all of the elements that go into your HACCP plan, absolutely. And uh, you know, HACCP plans also go, uh, go hand in hand with uh, inspectors and all of those things. And so you can, you know, inspector asks a question, you can answer, but you can also go, here is you know, a class that we have that teaches how to do that. And you can actually show them exactly me saying you know, how safe it is and why. And so, um, yes, it w will help with the HACCP plan and everything around it. So, because the HACCP plan is really a pyramid. It's the HACCP plan is the top of the pyramid that kind of like, it's the document that shows that you're doing everything correctly. Well, the class shows you how to do everything correctly or, exa or at least in the correct way that, or one of the correct ways that I've found of doing it or that we've found of doing it. So, yes. So one of the things you're going to, to what, one of the things that happens when you're when you're scaling up as a kombucha producer is you get surprises. Um, surprises when you're working with four liters are kind of okay, and we have a tendency to forget about them or go, oh, it's fine. We can just blend this and that. Um, when you have a thousand liters of kombucha and you know you can't drink it, you can't bottle it, and you're and there's stores expecting it, then um, then you know it becomes it becomes a real problem. And so, you know, what we can do or what we do in the master class is go, okay, well, if you just take exactly the same recipe um, as you do with four liters and brew it in a thousand liters, here are the top 10 things that are going to happen and here's how to avoid them. Here's a ton of different ways to avoid them. The reality is everyone's in a different situation. So, um, so you know, there's a lot of different solutions. But, uh, but basically, you know, expectations from shops, uh, longer time on the shelves, uh, distributions, Distribution makes it so that you have to have good traceability um, and inspections can open you up to fines and lawsuits. So, you know, higher alcohol, uh, higher sugar than is declared. Uh, these are all things that you need to kind of have control of. So um, oftentimes I, it's, it's funny because whenever I get a bottle, of, you know, whenever people manage to make a bottle of something and like sell it, it always kind of feels like an exercise in impossibility because there's so many things that can go wrong. And, you know, you know, in the 10 years that I've, that I've been around, I've like kind of seen all the things that can go wrong. So whenever we're about to do something, okay, how do we make sure that this doesn't happen, this doesn't happen, this doesn't happen. So anyway, a lot of things can go wrong. That's what a quality assurance system is. It's going, hey, how do we make sure these things don't go wrong? So you need a stable and a consistent kombucha. That's the name of the game, right? So um, now stable and consistent kombucha, people are going, a lot of people are going, okay, like that's nice to say, but you know, how exactly do you do that, right? Um, well, there's a lot of different ways of doing it. There's a lot of different ways of doing it. There's some, there's, there's some ways of controlling your kombucha and making it stable that resemble, uh, trying to uh, balance, um, you know, a jar on a, uh, on a needle. Right. So that's kind of like, and so, you know, kombucha is very wild. Kombucha is unpredictable. Um, and you can kind of, of course there's, it's possible that, you know, any, any process can give the, the good result, but you will need to stay with the process. You need to work with the process that's going to give you a result that works, you know, 99 or 100% of the time. And so what we found is um, that using much older kombucha, so taking kombucha and let it, letting it age um, is kind of a really great way of, uh, of kind of having all the things that you want is not starving your culture not having to have a degree in microbiology, not having to invest in a lot of equipment, and having absolute certainty that your product has no alcohol in it, or very, very low. And so all those things together. And also, what's great is that, you know, as a producer right now, maybe you make four liters of kombucha, and you know, you go away for the weekend, you come back and you go, oh, it's too sour, what do I do with it? Well, now your kombucha is acidifier. An acidifier, you let it sit for a few, a few more days, or a few more weeks, uh, all the alcohol gets eaten up and it becomes a very strong, super potent kombucha. So there's all of these, all of these, um, all of these things that happen when kombucha gets older that just make it better. Um, 
So there's a lot of other things that are going to happen when you scale up, uh, you know, that can, that can cause issues. So sourcing ingredients is different. Uh, this is a big one because, you know, you know, I've done this a few times, even like at the, with the, the kombucha at Mabrasserie. So Mabrasserie is a cooperative that we brew kind of a boutique kombucha at. I used to brew 20, I used to be brew maybe a hundred liters at a time, which meant that I could kind of just go out into the alleyway and pick, uh, you know, pick the, the roses from the neighbor and they wouldn't really notice and I could put it in the kombucha and it would be fine. But once you start making a thousand liters, you can't really do that without getting noticed. Um, and so buying them and if you buy them you need to make sure that it's not just at the store at the corner it's a place that you know if it becomes a large volume you can you can make sure that you have consistent uh consistent uh a consistent source of it and so sourcing ingredients controlling alcohol as well you know one of the rules is the bigger your tank or the deeper your tank the higher the alcohol that's just the way it is um you know stability of flavor taste and color over time a lot of uh, producers uh, have a product that is uh you know really good and i mean everyone's gonna have a perfect product when it goes in the bottle right that's just kind of how it goes it might be a little bit boozy but it's gonna taste really good because you're good you're good kombucha producers you put your heart into it but you know sometimes you'll take a kombucha off the shelf that's you know a few months a few months old um in the store and you go how did someone bottle this it was because they didn't understand the stability of their product the stability of the the taste the color the sweetness the sourness and all those things and so it's, uh, it's about understanding that. Um, fermentation times as well. Um, you know, raise your hand if you've had, you know, a dozen bottlers, a dozen bottlers come into your factory and then have to send them home because your kombucha wasn't ready. Um, I did uh, a lot of times. And so, you know, having a stable uh, kombucha fermentation, uh, knowing, you know, how to control it and, and when it's going to be ready is super important as well, just because you want to manage your business in a stable way. You don't want all your kombucha to be ready when you have to go on vacation. Um, and then you need to have a consistent shelf life of your product and you also need to get the right equipment. Um, getting the right equipment is, is intimately linked with having a process that's controlled, right? Um, people regularly call me up, they go, hey, I have this factory. Um, and I started, you know, I, I went from making 20 liter buckets uh, you know, five or six 20 liter buckets and they're going really well, but I've gone and I've moved to 200 liter fermenters or 1000 liter fermenters and it's really not working anymore. Um, you know, but I've invested in all this equipment. How can we get things going? And so having uh, the right equipment is also going to uh, depend on which process you decide you're going to take. And so uh, it's really important to know what your process is and what the end game is and what the walls you're going to hit are before you purchase the equipment. That having been said, uh, one of my jobs is, uh, is when pe people just go, here's what I got, what's the best we can do with it. And then we just kind of just figure it out. So that's really fun for me. Um, I never, never go, you know what, you're screwed. I'm going home. There is a, a couple of questions here. So one was, um, I think Dan tried to answer a little bit there. Um, the question was like, you, you mentioned the deeper your tank the more alcohol what's the what's the science behind that and like what did, what did you mean by the deeper the tank the more alcohol or the more chance of alcohol right okay well so there's a there's a metaphor that i'm working on that i think is kind of like the biggest uh, the biggest uh, the the best one that i've got so far but let's see how it goes so you have a bowl right and the bowl is uh, is uh, it's a it, it's an empty bowl now um at the top of your tank you have uh okay let's not talk about the bowl yet but basically um, your SCOBY is what eats up the alcohol, right? Your SCOBY is what eats, eats up the alcohol and it's at the surface of your tank. Mm -hmm. So, it, so it's really only, uh, it's, and yeah, so it's, so it's at the surface of your tank and, and basically, uh, your yeast, uh, is in all of your liquid, right? Now, if you make your tank bigger, so for example, if you just make your tank deeper, you have a lot more yeast than you have bacteria. Your yeast produce alcohol and your bacteria eat it. So if you make your tank deeper, you have more yeast, which produce more alcohol, and the bacteria that's at top are still eating it at the same speed. So imagine you have a bowl, a, a bowl, right? And the yeast are, it's a, and M&Ms are alcohol, okay? M&Ms are alcohol. So you have a bowl, and all the yeast, so you have one yeast putting uh, M&Ms into a bowl, and then you have your bacteria taken out you have one bacteria taking out M&Ms from the bowl, right? You're not gonna accumulate M&Ms in the bowl because one is going at the same speed as the other, right? Now, 
if you have, let's say you make your tank bigger, right? So you're putting more yeast. So let's say you have three yeast putting M&Ms into the bowl and you still have only that one bacteria taking M&Ms out of the bowl at the same speed as it was doing before. Suddenly your bowl is filling up with M&Ms, right? And that is the concept. That is the kind of the reasoning behind why a bigger tank, a deeper tank produces more alcohol. It's because when you make your tank bigger, you're not adding more bacteria. You're just adding more yeast. And so the bacteria is feeding alcohol into that. Um, and the bacteria, so the, the yeast is feeding alcohol into the kombucha, whereas the bacteria is still eating it at the same speed. Now, what happens is over time, the, the, the yeast stop, uh, stop producing alcohol and the bacteria keep eating it. And so that's why a long fermentation time will help allow the bacteria to catch up. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's good. There's a couple other questions, but I'm going to hold off. Like I see them, Tom and Nick and um, Michael. I'll let Seb keep going. I'm going to make note of the questions and we can go back to it. And I'm not sure if we discovered something that was pretty amazing. Imagine alcoholic M&Ms. I think we're onto something there. Okay, go yeah, ahead. I mean, you could just put M&Ms in your vodka. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, keep going. I'll, I'll hold okay, off yeah, the yeah, questions um, for the more. next couple of slides. Um, okay, so, so basically, how can we control your kombucha while keeping it happy, right? So there's a couple of stones. There's a couple of like, the science is undeniable with these things. And these are, you know, this is, it's kind of, it's not subjective. It's really just like, this is how kombucha goes. And so, um, it's what we've discovered that just that always happens with all kombucha, right? So over time, the alcohol drops to almost zero. So, so in any given kombucha, if you keep it open and you keep it fermenting with oxygen, the alcohol drops to almost zero. So depending on the size of the tank, um, you know, it'll take, so the deeper the tank, the longer it takes. So you're good with shorter tanks, but it's hard to grow your factory with small tanks. Um, so the product just gets more sour over time as well. So, you know, after a month, two months, three months, it's just gonna get more and more sour. The yeast settles out of the product. So yeast don't really like acidity. And so at the beginning of the fermentation, they're super happy, but as soon as it gets, it hits a certain amount of sourness, they settle out, they go to sleep. And that's when the bacteria start eating up the last of the alcohol. And over time, the product becomes less funky. So a lot of these esters, um, like these, uh, these or sulfur flavor, sulfur taste, or all of these weird things that can happen to your kombucha will disappear over time in, a, in the open top fermentation as well. And so, so from that, we can know that we can make a product that's less funky, you know, that's less weird, that's got less, you know, um, barn, barnyard character, or anything like that, that's got no sugar, or that's got, well, no sugar as well, but that's got uh, very low alcohol, that's really sour, and that's got almost no yeast in it, all you need to do is let it age. And so, and this is considering that our product, our, our objective is non-alcoholic kombucha. So I'd say, you know, 95% of producers are doing, are looking to make a non-alcoholic kombucha. So this is kind of what we do, which is funny because we're really good at making non-alcoholic kombucha. So we get really confused when, or we used to get really confused when people ask for alcoholic kombucha because we could just go, well, you just let it do its thing. So we have a couple different methods uh, that, we, that we've kind of proposed, uh, kind of stemming from, from experience and people going, oh, I like this method, but I don't like this about it. So basically we've cut it into a couple different methods. This is our one day method, and this is my favorite one. So how does it work? Um, so you brew your kombucha just like you would normally, except that, uh, yeah, with 10 or 20% starter, except you usually put less sugar. You put sh the amount of sugar that you want in your final product, so usually, Usually that's, uh, usually people are putting 6% sugar uh, to ferment, but then uh, in this product, you only put maybe four or 4.5. You want kind of the amount that you want in your, in your final product. And then you add some acidifier, which is some really old kombucha. How much? It depends. Um, you know, if it's really, really old kombucha, uh, it'll be, you'll put maybe uh, 20%. Uh, if it's younger, it might be 30%. Uh, we have a product called Manike, you put 5%. Um, and so, uh, so you add acidifier, and what that does is you're basically blending a really young kombucha that's got all this yeast and bacteria, and it's really happy, and it's got booze in it, and it's just like you're, it's a super happy kombucha, and it's like, it's basically like a nice summer brew that's like bubbly and all that, and, but it's got alcohol in it. That, that happy brew has alcohol in it. So what you do is you blend it with a really old kombucha that's got all of the acidity, all of the long fermented antioxidants, but doesn't have any of the alcohol. So you kind of blend those together 
And it's very much the same thing as Lambic beers um, in Belgium or things like that, where they just take different aged beers and mix them together to make, make it taste the same all the time. Um, and then you ferment it for 12 to 24 hours. So what happens in those 12 to 24 hours is um, you get, uh, you know, the tea that you've added in there, if you're adding some tea, gets fermented. And a lot of that sediment that you've, uh, there's sediment that forms. If you've done infusions, you're adding sugar, you'll get like SCOBY that'll form. Sometimes um, the 12 to 24 hour period will, there'll be some SCOBY that'll form in your product and you can take it out so that it doesn't form in your bottle. Uh, it also kind of just rounds off the taste. As a general rule, that's kind of, you, like when you just blend it, you go, okay, this is good. But then the next day you go, oh yeah, this is what I was looking for. And so um, it also allows it to produce like a 0 0.1 or 0.2% alcohol. Alcohol tastes really good. So an alcohol-free kombucha tastes less good than the kombucha that got 1% in it. That's just kind of how it is. Um, and so that's, that's, that's our, our main method. What's really nice about this is that, uh, you know, if you're certified, is that you have better throughput as well. I mean, if you get an order on Monday, you know, you can have it in the store on Friday. So um, you have a lot more control over sugar. Um, there's a, a good amount of yeast and bacteria, so you can have a very lively kombucha. And what's fun about a kombucha like this is uh, you might, you know, add carbonation into it. But you can add just a little bit so that it's like good on day zero but it's going to continue to ferment in the bottle, which means that when a client buys it in, you know, three, four weeks, there's some of that natural fizz as well. Some maybe like 50, 50, 50% 50 natural carbonation, 50% added. So it allows you to have all the carbonation that you want in the fizz without the alcohol. Cause we made this little chart here. We made these for kombucha con, but we couldn't. Uh, so it's a little carbonation chart and actually shows you that if you want to get zero point, uh, let's see here, if you want 2.6 volumes of CO2 of natural carbonation, it's gonna create 0.3% alcohol. So basically if you want something that's like relatively fizzy, um, you get that it's, it's gonna go up by 0.3% alcohol just in the bottle. Um, and so if you already have it fizzy a little bit, then it can create just a little bit of CO2, just a little bit of alcohol and kind of have that, have that product uh, be exactly what you want it and be, uh, and be, uh, ex be exactly what you want it and be, you know, um, compliant, right? Because compliance is, is something that we, uh, that we worry about. Um, so basically there's a couple different, so it, one of the, the biggest things I'd like to take out of this, or I'd like you guys to take out of this, this presentation is that um, there's a different, and it, it took me, I don't know how long it took me to, to kind of like understand the difference between these things or kind of just place them in different places in my head. Starter tea and acidifier. So basically starter tea is formulated to make your SCOBY happy, right? Make it super wild, make it like alcoholic, make it so your SCOBY is like having a blast. But if your SCOBY is having a blast, it means it's creating alcohol, it means it's going to do whatever it wants and it's not going to be stable. It's going to have alcohol and it's going to be a difficult product to sell, a, different, uh, a, a difficult product to build a business on, right? Now, acidifier as well. So acidifier is just basically starter tea that you've just let ferment for a long time. So you guys have all made acidifier. You've all let a four liter batch, uh, forget it for a month, um, two months, and you should go, oh, this is really sour. So that's acidifier. So that's good stuff. Um, and this is, this is, these are products that are fermenting, that are meant to, you know, to, to, pro, to create bacteria, to create acidity, to have no the acidifiers to eat up the alcohol. So, and they, it's just tea, water, sugar, and SCOBY, right? Just like you guys have all done. And then, um, so here's, here's actually a little graph that's, a, that's really interesting. So we're talking about starter tea and acidifier. So, um, if we have a graph, if we had a time, so on the timeline, um, you see this little alcohol peak and you guys can't see where I'm pointing. Can you guys see where I'm pointing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so right here, this alcohol peak is usually around day 14. So, so usually, uh, when people bottle their kombucha there, it's at its highest alcohol content and, and the acids are slowly going up. And so if you see here, a young kombucha, this is all the fermentations, all the kombucha that you've ever made. They start off starter tea, you know, like at day 14, it's starter tea. It's perfect. It's good. Delicious. So you let it age, it's acidifier. And that's kind of, uh, you know, the, the two different categories. So there's starter tea, there's acidifier, and then there's final product. So 
Um, what does it say? I'm just going to skip this slide. Okay, so 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 we have that, and we're we're fermenting that just like we've always fermented. But then, if we're making final product, final product, you don't want your scoby to be wild. You don't want the bacteria and yeast to go crazy. You don't want the alcohol. So what you do is kind of separate the formulations. You make when you're making tea and you're making acidifier, you're you're giving love to your scoby. You're making it happy. It's going wild. When you're making a final product, you want it to be relatively stable. You want the bacteria and yeast to be as high as possible, but you also want, yeah, you want the bacteria and yeast to be as high as possible, but you also don't want to make your bottles explode. You don't want them to make too much gunk. You don't want them to uh, make alcohol. And so, um, and so by, by having that in, in, in mind, we can make a recipe of a product that is a final product that's drinkable and stable, and that's not necessarily made to ferment, but is fermented. And so that's why, um, that's why we use the formulations for a finished product that are starter tea, acidifier, tea sugar, water, and whatever flavor you want. Um, you know, and that's, it also allows you to kind of just put anything in your final product, right? It, you don't have to worry about, is it going to mess with your fermentation? You know, if you can put stevia, you can put erythritol. Those are bad examples. No one really likes sweeteners. But you can put maple syrup, you can put honey, you could put all these things in a finished product and not have to worry about how fermentable they are. You can also um, know that you can also control the amount of alcohol that's going to be in your final product. I always assume that starter tea has 2% alcohol. I assume that pretty much any kombucha that's you know 14 days old has 2% alcohol. It's kind of like the upper limit of what happens kind of normally. Um, and so if I do that, what I do is I'll put 10% starter tea, which means that I'll have 10 times less alcohol. So I'm at 0.2%. Um, and this is, let's say I'm making a hundred liters of kombucha, a final product. I'll put 10 liters of starter tea. I'll put 10 liters of acidifier. I'll put tea, sugar, water, just like I normally would. And my flavor, just like I normally would. Um, and it allows me to know hundred percent sure that my kombucha is, is compliant. Uh, it also allows me to kind of just make as much or as little as I want, uh, according to what I need. And it also allows me to deliver it on the same week as I get the order. So. So how do you know when your acidifier or your starter is ready? So this is a picture of Julia Child when she was brewing her kombucha starter. She doesn't really talk about that book, uh, but yeah, she's, she's a very good kombucha maker. That's not true, that's a lie, but we wish, right? Um, so starter is uh, usually between 2.80 and 3.20. So that's, uh, you guys recognize your, uh, the pH of your, of your starter there. Acidifier is at 2.70 or lower. Um, some of you also recognize it going, oh man, this is really, this is really sour. Um, you know, 2.70 or lower. I usually go for 2.55, 2.60. Basically, the lower, the better. Um, so what's the difference? Why, why do we have these two? Uh, well, the yeast usually goes to sleep around pH of 3.05 or 3.00. And so if you want a starter, you don't want it to be too sour. You want the, 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 the kombucha to be healthy. You want the culture to be there. Acidifier, the bacteria, no, the yeast has been sleeping for a while. And so if you're just using acidifier, then you might be missing a lot of that yeast character, a lot of that yeast, which is, uh, you know, which is very much part of the living, you know, SCOBY. So, um, yeah, our acidifier, we sell acidifier, it's about 2.47 pH, 2.55. Um, and so. Cool. And I just want to say that Dan, um, Dan put a link up in the chat to, um, talked about the uh, the manike and he also put his email up there. It's just dan at mananova.com. So if you want to ask more questions or inquire about the um, the manike and mananova's um, acidifier, then you can uh, email Dan. I'll, Dan, you can put your email up just again, um, just to make sure it's it's there. Sorry, go ahead, go ahead, Seb. Right. Thank you. Um, yeah, and you know, if you feel free to contact us, uh, we have uh, you know we have all sorts of info for for whoever wants to whoever calls us up or asks questions and you know there's a lot of different formats uh the you know the name of the game for us is be generous you know be generous make you guys happy push you forward uh and so that's the impression that everyone gets when dealing with us so so don't be afraid to just give us a shout you know i'll spend some time with you or dan uh loves spending time uh talking to people uh we all do actually and so uh and so yeah just really don't don't feel shy to contact us um, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop sharing the screen. And I'll I'll kind of look into the questions. 
Does that yeah, sound sweet. good? Well, I, I took note of a couple um, questions and that's, that's awesome. I appreciate um, that. I know that's super informative um, for myself and I know for, I'm sure everybody else here, and I can vouch to vouch right now for the generosity of Mananova and Seb and Dan and the whole team. I mean, I've chatted with them about um, a few kombucha projects and they collaborated with me on, on Boochfest and it is like take advantage of, not take advantage, but when people make offers like that and want to contribute and be part of a bigger kind of multi, um, multi organism, that sort of thing and a, a bigger culture then there are people to do that. So feel free to email them and ask questions. They're, they're super generous. Um, yeah. We love being useful. Cool. So one of the questions was um, talking about um, acidifiers and old culture. So um, it looks like Tom had to stop production because of the COVID outbreak. So they don't have um, a lot of product, um, but can this, like he said, can this super acidifier culture be used as a, as a starter if it's just been sitting around for a while? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, you know, if you're making your own acidifier at home uh, and you have a, kind of an old, uh, if you have a lot of old kombucha lying around, then yes, absolutely. Use it as an acidifier. I always like to keep some younger kombucha lying around um, just, you know, for the bubbles and kind of the, the I just, I'll, I usually, as a starter, I'll use a younger kombucha, something that's like 14 to 30 days old. Um, and, uh, but yes, absolutely. So right now, a lot of you maybe are producing or like our producers, but have uh, slowed down production because of COVID. Um, and so, yes, you guys are producing acidifier, which means that, you, that all of this kombucha that's fermenting and it's too sour is going to be perfect for making kombucha, uh, your final product later on. So, um, you know, what I always recommend is kind of just, uh, playing around in one liter, one liter size, just cause it's really easy to calculate after that. So um, I would just do like a regular, a regular tea and like a, your regular recipe of a formulated finished product and then just add acidifier until it tastes good or you reach the pH that you want. And then just write that down and then blow up the recipe. Um, uh, just kind of make it bigger, go, okay, this is good. Let, let me make 20 liters of that. And uh, yes, absolutely. Um, you know, with the, if you don't have some young starter kombucha, you might end up having some issues with slower bottle fermentation which is you know, some good for some people and bad for some people. Um, and so in that case, uh, you definitely add some, some young starter in there or carbonate the product and or carbonate the product. So uh, yes, definitely all this old kombucha that you have is super usable. Um, if you want a little bit more clear instructions, uh, just give us a shout. You go, here's what we have, here's the pH of it. And I'll just give you a, a, little, uh, a little kind of protocol to try. I go, this is what I would do. Um, and then we can have some back and forth on that. Cool. Um, there's a question uh, from Michael just about stirring, uh, fermenting kombucha when the idea is adding more oxygen. Um, so does it, one, add more oxygen and two, like, does it support alcohol breakdown in any way by like stirring and moving your kombucha around? What sort of uh, thing does that I think, have? I think, um, so what I've seen is, so in the first 14 days of, of production, um, how can I answer this? Okay, so so basically, depending on that, to make um, kind of like a starter kombucha that's going to be um, compliant. So if you're just making kombucha at light, just like a starter, or just like you would make at home, and stirring and stirring it to make it compliant is not going to work. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time going, maybe it'll work, but it's just like it doesn't work. But if you um, you know if you do uh, if you know if you're making your acidifier. Uh, an old kombucha and you kind of want it to go a little bit faster then yeah you can you can stir it once a day and maybe instead of taking you know um instead of taking six months uh you know for a thousand liter batch it might take three months um there's a there's a really nice uh there's a really nice um uh piece of equipment on the market now that you can monitor the alcohol of your product with it's called the rare combinations alcohol tester um, and, uh, it allows you to check the alcohol in your batch kind of really easily. Uh, and, uh, and that's a really nice way of knowing if your acidifier is ready. Cause it's just, it doesn't, it's not a question of how sour it is. Cause it's always going to be too sour, but it's really a question of like, is there any alcohol left in there? Um, and so, uh, I don't remember what the question was. Did I answer it? Yeah. Good enough. Yeah. <laughs> yes. What was the, um, the alcohol it was rare combinations. Is that what you said? Yeah, rare combinations. Yeah. 
I think we have a promo code as well for for them. If uh, I just put a link up. It's just the, it's the, this uh, it's this university student from Georgia who's just really smart and designed this machine. Um, and it's uh, like the price point is great. I just I, I'm in love with this piece of equipment. Um, and I have no interest in, I have no financial interest in that. No. <laughs> I'm just saying it because it really is a good piece of equipment. So, uh, but yeah, that would be the way to do it. So the answer to the question, yes, you can stir it, but stir it at the end, after a month. After a month, because if you stir it too early, you might, uh, you might uh, oxygenate the yeast. And if you oxygenate the yeast, the yeast reproduce, and then you can get some weird tastes. Or, anyway, I just, after 30 days, yes, you can, you can mix it around. Cool. Um, there was a, a question around just yeast since you're chatting about it. It's like, um, I guess without going too, too much down the rabbit hole, um, you, you talked a little bit about like what role does yeast play? So if I'm either a home brewer or if I'm brewing bigger, bigger batches, is there like a, is there too much yeast? Is there a reason why I would get too much yeast? Um, like what's, what's the deal with some yeast and that sort of thing? Like what's the effect of it and why would I care about if I have too much or how would I know there's too much? Well, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a funny question because, you know, it's always, it's always a question of like, okay, is my SCOBY good? Is my SCOBY doing well? Um, with starter and acidifier, you can do whatever you want and it's going to be fine. So you don't have to worry about if there's too much, if it's different from one time to the next because it's always going to, it's always going to get alcoholic. After that, it's going to go down to zero. Your yeast is going to be happy. Your bacteria is going to be happy. It's going to get less funky. All of those things that I said before, they're all going to happen no matter what, if there's too much or too little. Now, um, in your final product, you know, at, at home, you know, at home, it's not an issue either because if your product's at 1% or 1.5 or two, it doesn't really matter. Um, at home, you'll be, you know, a home brewer is going to be at 1% or less just because the tank is so small, usually, just in case that was a question. Um, but um, what was I saying? Sorry, the coffee is wearing off. <laughs> just talking about the yeast. And oh, yeah. Uh, so in your, in your final product, in your final product, you can choose to have less yeast. If you're, if you're, a, if you're a commercial brewer uh, and you want your product to be relatively stable, then you do want your yeast to be as low as possible. And that's just kind of the name of the game. It's like gas and gas and, and, and motors, right? The yeast are the motors and the sugar is the gas. Uh, and you put, put them together, things are gonna move. And so, and so in a final product, yes, you, can, you do want to, uh, in a final product that you want to be stable in refrigerators for yeah, three or six months, then yeah, you want, to, you want your product to have as little yeast as possible. Um, but, uh, but at home, not really. At home, it's really cool. At home, you know, more yeast means slightly more alcoholic, which just means, you know, you can drink it later in the day. And it's fine. Or earlier in the day, since some of us are going to work or you're working from home, yeah. so nobody knows anyway. Yeah. Um, so John, John Chilton says hi. Hey, John, how's it going? <laughs> and uh, he also said hi to every, everybody else who... Uh, knows him so he said uh, yeah a few familiar faces here big smiley face he's like i've had to significantly adjust my production and i've stored booch in the corny kegs uh ph was 2.8 fermented over six to seven weeks um, now he's got him in the fridge around four celsius uh what's going to happen uh to the alcohol and ph over time so it's um so what's going to happen so the the alcohol ob uh, obviously goes up over time uh, you can actually check your bricks and really get a, a good idea of how much alcohol is going to be um, of how much alcohol is going to be produced. Actually, I have it right here uh, on my little carbonation chart. So, change in bricks. Can you read this? No, no, not readable. Okay, so for example, uh, a change in bricks of 0 0.5 means that you will have 0.2% alcohol produced, and a change in bricks of 0 0.8 means that you'll have 0.4% alcohol produced. So that's kind of exact numbers. Now, you'd think that in the fridge or in a keg, it would continue to, the, the bacteria would continue to ferment and you, it would get more sour. But actually what happens uh, is uh, you get a little bit of what's called autolysis. So when yeast slowly die off, they actually bring your pH up. And so don't be surprised if, you're, if your kegs that were at 2.80 uh, when you bottle them are at like 3.10 or something like that. It's not a big deal. It's pretty much going to taste the same and it's just kind of the natural 
the natural evolution of it. So, um, so you know, what would I do? Um, I don't know what I would do. There's a lot of different things. I mean, everything's gonna be okay. <laughs> That's nice. That's um, nice. You know, maybe just purge your kegs once in a while. Um, yeah, purge your kegs once in a while. Uh, or actually, if you just go, just check the pressure in your keg. If you, you know what pressure you put it at, check the pressure in your keg uh, after refrigeration. And I will tell you uh, exactly how much alcohol was made with this handy carbonation chart that I was supposed to give to everyone at KBI. <laughs> cool. Thanks for that. Um, couple, just one quick question. Um, Nikki, they're from the UK, and I guess they said they've never heard of BRICS. So what's, what's BRICS? Oh, uh, great question. Yeah, BRICS. So BRICS is, is uh, the, the, it's a capital B, um, kind of like in the same way Celsius is. It's like the guy who took temperature the first time, his name was Celsius. So the guy who measured, uh, who put water into sugar, or who put sugar into water and then measured the refraction index, um, the first time was called Mr. BRICS. Uh, and so what we do is we use a refractometer, which is, looks like a little telescope, and it actually uh, uses, uses uh, it, Basically, the sweeter liquid is, the more it bends the light. And so if you put a, if you put a ruler at the end of where that light is bent, you, uh, a ruler, you get units, and then that's what BRICS is. So you get a refractometer off of eBay, like a 0 to 32 refractometer, not a so 0 to 32 BRICS, because that's the range that kombucha is in. Don't get a honey refractometer, because um, it won't work. Um, and, so, and, then, and so you take that refractometer, you put your drop of kombucha in there, you look at it and you'll see like a ruler, there'll be a, there'll be a bar and it'll tell you how much sugar is in your kombucha. So um, it, doesn't, it tells you approximately how much sugar is in your kombucha. It's B-R-I-X is the unit. Um, it's a little bit interchangeable with kind of like a density or a, um, yeah, density or, or degrees Plato. Uh, but basically what it boils down to is it's, it's a, le a reading of sugar content uh, in your kombucha. Cool. Thanks for that. Um, we got, we got about like eight minutes left so we can get to um, a few more, a few more questions. You're still good to hang out for another eight minutes and we'll. Me? Oh yeah. Okay, sweet. Um, <laughs> right on. There was a question around, um, is there a, a rule or any secret to getting more carbonation, um, but keeping the alcohol down below the, the 1% or 0.5%? Um, no, there is no secret. Uh, there's, it's a very, there's a, it's, it's the, the math is clear. The, the chemistry is very clear. For one molecule of glucose, actually I don't remember the stoichiometry exactly, but basically for, uh, for let's say one gram of glucose or sugar, it gets turned into 0 0.5 grams of CO2 and 0 0.5 grams of alcohol. And so there is no, there is no way of dissociating those. Um, now that your best case scenario, your best case scenario is adding a little bit of CO2, like through, with a tank, um, and then uh, letting it carbonate a tiny little bit in the bottle. And that's kind of the, probably for someone who wants natural carbonation, but doesn't want the alcohol, that's the best way to go. And the secret is that, you know, kombucha that has a little bit of starter or that has starter in it or like a kombucha that has yeast in it will continue to ferment in the bottle whether you want it to or not. So even though it might not come out of the factory with any uh, of those naturally produced bubbles, two weeks in, there's a ton of those natural bubbles in there. And, uh, and you know, that's, that's one of the challenges of being a brewer is, is putting a product out that's a little bit younger than you want the consumer to drink it. A lot of people will put out their product you know, tasting exactly like, like they, they want their consumer to drink it, but the average consumer will drink it, you know, four or six weeks later when it's going to taste different. And so putting out a product that's a little bit younger um, is, uh, is kind of one of the challenges to that. So, um, but there is, yeah, there is no way of kind of getting, of just putting, of, of having, uh, you know, of closing a bottle of non-fizzy kombucha, making it fizzy and not having the alcohol. There's not the... I mean, I tried really hard. I mean, I've tried it every. And if someone has a, I mean, it doesn't. It just doesn't exist. Yeah. <laughs> nice. <Sorry. laughs> um, let's go back to the tanks here. When you're talking about like the depth of the tanks and the radius and that sort of thing. So, um, someone is asking, is there like a golden ratio of height to to radius for for brewing in bigger tanks? I know in 
Andres from uh, Kiss Kombucha in Vermont just actually gave a little suggestion here or um, their thoughts just saying that they, they do, they try and match the di diameter with the height. So close to equal. Is that what you would recommend or what are your thoughts on the radius and height? I mean, so what, I mean what I've seen is it's not so much a question of, of, of uh, it's not so much a question of matching the depth to, to the, the depth. So the, the, the fact of the matter is, so, okay, 15 centimeters deep. That's, that's, if you want to have, like, if you want to have a, like a kombucha, like the one that you make at home and you want to bottle it and you want it to be compliant, your best bet is to have tanks that are 15 centimeters deep. So that's kind of like, that's the, that's like the easy answer, right? Now the complicated answer is. Hold on. What do you mean 15 centimeters deep? That's not very deep. Like, okay. Yeah. It's like, you can have like a swimming pool or something. It's like, okay, said that's really stupid, right? Like how am I supposed to do that? Like, I know, I know, but that's kind of just, it's, that's the science of it. Um, it's like, you'll probably never get over 0.5% if you, if you stay this deep, but anything else, you know, it's going to be, um, you'll have to use alternate methods to make sure that you're compliant, um, you know, a hundred percent of the time. Now, um, now the complicated answer is that, uh, you know, we were talking about the, the liquid is the part that makes the alcohol and the surface is the part that creates the acidity, right? Now, uh, anyone here a math teacher? Nat, no, Dan, no. Okay. Anyway, I was a math tutor for a while. <laughs> and so um, the formula, so basically, uh, if you make a tank bigger, right, you, you just make the radius bigger. Just basically, you just grow a tank by like, you know, you just grow it, like take all the measurements and, and just multiply them by two. Well, your volume goes up by the cube of that. So let's say you have a tank that's one meter by one meter by one meter. Well, the surface area is one meter squared, right? And the volume is one meter cubed. But if you double all the measurements, two meters, two meters, two meters, then your surface area is two times two. So that's four meters squared. And your volume is two times two times two. So that's eight meters cubed. And so your volume grows faster than your surface area, which means that, um, which means that, that as you grow, um, your surface area becomes a smaller, it grows at a much slower speed than your volume does, which is why making tanks bigger uh, makes them exponentially more potential for alcohol. So this is why I've designed uh, the mini um, unit tank. Um, I mean, the mini, the mini uh, tote. So you can get 100,000 of these in your factory and ensure that you'll always have um, compliant kombucha. It is uh, 15 centimeters deep exactly. Um, so there you go. Not really for sale, it's just a prop. Um, it's actually not mine, it's, uh, it's Brewer Barbies. Here we go, hi BC. Okay, uh, next question. No, keep going with the, uh, the Brewer Barbie and the, the tanks and all that. Brewer Barbie's unit tank as well, so this is, is the person way and the, she likes to brew on it. Sweet. Any more, any more questions, guys? We've got like a minute. I think we'll, we'll probably wrap up there. Um, Dan, do you want to um, throw down the, a couple links? Like feel free to link to the Mananova, link to the masterclass, uh, put your email down there. So just that's all the contact info. Um, Anything else you wanted to add, Seb, about um, how to how to follow you guys, get in contact with you guys? Um, yeah, I mean we're on we're on Instagram, we're on Facebook, uh, Mananova Solutions. Um, I mean the easiest is just check out our website and get in touch with with Dan. Uh, he's uh, he's our he's the guy who who his job is to make sure he answers you real quick and be really pleasant because that's just what he loves to do. Um, and uh, yeah, just give us a shout um, and, uh, and you know, we'll really do our best to help you out. Right on, well, I appreciate that. That was, um, like I said, super informative. Sometimes a little bit over my head, but I think that's part of the fun about um, getting into the kombucha and getting a little bit deep, deeper into the weeds. Because the fun part about kombucha I find is like, you start making it at home and then you get curious about um, commercial brews that are happening at 
commercial brews that, are, that you see in the grocery stores and health food stores, you start experimenting, you see the ingredients, kind of opens your mind about it, and then you just dig deeper and deeper. So I think it's nice to learn that. Brewing your first gallon of kombucha is super exciting, but there's a whole world to it. Don't get too overwhelmed because it's just fun to brew your own, but there's a whole world to kombucha. So I um, encourage you guys to go check out Mananova dot com there and then also go support your local kombucha brewers go buy a bottle check out online a lot of them are delivering now so um please check out your local kombucha brewers order a case um, that way you can experiment with it you can see what sort of ingredients they use um you can compare yours to them you can mimic those styles so that's pretty cool everyone's saying thanks just so you know uh said that was uh that was great appreciate your time um, Thank you, again. it was a pleasure yeah, we'll, we'll be back tomorrow, uh, 3 o'clock, like I said, every day until Saturday, 3 o'clock. Um, uh, if you go to our Facebook page or just Google Boochfest and find us there, we're going to have a nice little concert tomorrow and continue our brew party um, up until up until Saturday. So thanks, everybody, for joining. Enjoy your, enjoy your day. Happy brewing. She's a kombucha cutie. Kind of tangy, kind of fruity. Sprite and bubbly, sassy and free. <laughs> I'm gonna blare it, John, just for you. <laughs> my favorite foodie. You think you're getting annoyed? I've been listening to it all week. This is like my tenth time. <laughs> Digestive prescriptive can be a little addictive. I've got a bit of a buzz. I think I'm liking this pooch. Now the fungus, that's the mother. It reproduces my mother. So now we're gonna make a baby. Me and the cutie and the pooch. Kombucha cutie, kind of 